This is the biggest fallacy in entrepreneurship. Everybody thinks you have to have that brilliant idea, that epiphany, that thing that is going to change the world before you dive in. Well, mm. that's totally backwards. It's actually the opposite of what you should be doing because whatever's in your head at the beginning is usually wrong, like, or it's partially wrong. It might not be totally wrong. You might, you might have an idea of where to go, but you haven't gone there yet. And if it's something totally new that nobody's done before, then whatever you're imagining, you haven't done it either. And you won't actually know what works until you start doing it. So you've caught on. You've realized that the digital real estate game is taking over the physical real estate game. What I mean by that is every real estate transaction that occurs these days starts with a digital asset, such as this phone. Whether it's an interface, whether it's a software, whether it's a system, whether it's the MLS, whether it's an Airbnb or Verbo, it starts with a digital touch point. So in the digital asset series, we are going to talk about marketing. We're going to talk about digital marketing. We're going to talk about content. We're going to talk about branding. We're going to talk about the very own things or verticals that lead to real estate transactions, which you will realize that the majority of them are all virtual. This is why we're starting this segment because as important as we understand physical real estate is and will always be undestructible because people will always need a place to live, we understand that now technology is playing a whole different ball game in the real estate space and you wanna make sure that you have this on your tool belt and you understand how to leverage these digital assets so that you can have these experiments that can then lead to these physical assets. Now the same rules of the game apply as they always do in the lab. Get your white coat on, gloves on, notepad, and let's build y'all. experiment what is happening y'all today i have captain hoff in the lab who goes obviously by the name of steve hoffman but we know him as captain hoff because he's doing so much within the community in the, the tech space in the entrepreneur space he actually has um what i would i mean it's, it's it's unbelievable because i look at your list here and i have to pull it up and i'm like Golly, like where do I even start? But you're known as having founder space, being the CEO's founder space, the number one accelerator for uh, startups, uh, for overseas startups, which is really interesting because I definitely want to tap into that. How did you get to overseas as to why? But you also have a very interesting background. I we do our research here. I looked into the TV development background, which is interesting because we're in the multimedia space. This episode is brought to you by investedtalent.com. But we're super stoked to have you in the lab because when we talk about having a mad scientist, one who experiments in his lab like madness, you are an embodiment of that. And so I do want to welcome you into the lab with open arms and because you come in and you're having an impact that's bigger than yourself. And so, Steve, without further ado, my friend, welcome to the Real Estate Experiment Lab. How's it going today? It is fantastic to be here. And yes, I am a crazy scientist, especially <laughs> when it comes to entrepreneurs and startups. Oh, my gosh. I mean, you know. I, I, I want to give you a second to, you know, catch your breath and say hello, because if I was to go through your, you know, such a, an amazing and really um, uh, just remarkable history of what you've been able to do, um, I could go on forever. <clears throat> but to give individuals some context, being the CEO of Founder Space, you've obviously come from the world of Silicon Valley. You went to USC. You're actually an engineer. So I, I'm, I'm kind of interested to see how your mind works because you're wired that way, but you're also an entrepreneur because you've created businesses and now you're helping others do the same. And so there's so many components we can tackle this at, but I'll start off by saying you're joining us right now virtually. Of course, you're in the lab with us. Where are you dialing in from? Because I know that you travel a lot and I, you know, during this time, it's you know, Q4 of 2021. Uh, I'm just curious that where do you find yourself currently at the moment? Well, I have been traveling all across the United States, New York, Boston, Chicago. I am now just outside of Minneapolis. Wow. Minneapolis. Okay. Well, so thank you for joining us. Um, I got to start by asking you is 
Okay, so you're like a startup rocket fuel, right? When it comes to that, you're you're literally the rocket fuel that helps startups. Um, do you want to tell us first of all why did you pick a niche of kind of? Um, let me ask you. You say you're in the U.S., but are you primarily focused on Europe and Asia and and kind of going overseas? And if so, why uh, have you decided to kind of go in that niche over there? Is there something that we don't know that we need to know? Well, today there are innovation hubs everywhere. So we began Founder Space in Silicon Valley, working with Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. So that is our base, and we still do that. Half of our entrepreneurs are from the U.S. However, as we grew and we grew very fast, we started making connections globally. So all across Europe, all across Asia, and we started partnering with incubators, accelerators, governments overseas to give them access to Silicon Valley. And then we saw an opportunity where they all wanted to bring Silicon Valley to them, so we started to send our instructors and our programs overseas. So right now we have over 50 partners in 22 countries. We're working globally to really educate, train, and accelerate startups. Get them the capital they need. Get them the access they need to different strategic partners, to technology, to uh, resources all around the world, so that they can grow very rapidly. Okay, so I'm so glad you kind of gave us some good background because I think it helps us. But to someone who's listening, who's you know, um, you know, entrepreneur, listen, been listening to the show for quite some time. Uh, some of us are using existing frameworks, which I'm very curious to t- kind of dive into because you're more kind of like the innovator, right? Um, but let's just get some clarifications in place. You said accelerator. You said incubator. If I've never heard those terminologies before, what does that even mean? And, and, and where do you come in as um, the number one accelerator right, when it comes to you know startup accelerators? Where do you come in? How do you add value? So where we come in is we are both an incubator and an accelerator. And what I mean by that is incubators tend to work with earlier stage startups, startups mm. even at the idea stage where they're very, the very beginning. And then accelerators work with already established startups. So you have a team, you have a product in development or already launched. So you're going along and we are actually accelerating you to move faster, getting you the Mm. capital, the resources, the connections you need to actually take the market. Which one do you like better, Steve? Well, more profitable are the later stage companies. Let me tell you, it is really hard. The hardest thing entrepreneurs do, and I work with hundreds of entrepreneurs around the world, it's hard everywhere. The hardest thing is not coming up with the initial idea because everybody has an idea. The the hardest thing isn't actually raising capital because raising capital is actually quite easy once you get traction. The hardest thing is actually discovering demand. Now, I like to say, you know, the entrepreneur's first real job is to build a great team and then to go out there with this team and figure out where there is pent up demand that isn't being met by the market and then unleash this demand. That is what powers the growth of startups. Until you do that, everything is difficult. Okay. So I love that because here's what I'm hearing and I want to make sure it's clear. Typically, when we go into experiments in our lab, I'll just give you some context. It's um, the way I've created the show and the framework that I've used is that I experiment broad, right? So in order to experiment broad uh, in real estate, it was kind of getting exposed to different models, uh, going out into the marketplace. And then once I identified, hmm, interesting, this is not only one that fits for me and my skill set, but also the most important, not passion the demand in the marketplace, then I double down on that. So right now, currently for us, that's short-term rentals, especially with all that's been going on. Uh, that's one thing we've doubled down in. Now, from what I heard with you is, so, you know, I, I, I've built a team and a lot of people who are, have these teams. And what I heard from you is the t- you lead with the team, which is very interesting because most people think, oh, you lead with the idea. If I've heard you correctly, and then you course correct, am I right? Absolutely. This is what most, this is the biggest fallacy in entrepreneurship. Everybody thinks you have to have that brilliant idea, that epiphany, that thing that is going to change the world before you dive in. Well, Mm. that's totally backwards. It's actually the opposite of what you should be doing because whatever's in your head at the beginning is usually 
wrong. Like, or it's partially wrong. It might not be totally wrong. You might, you might have an idea of where to go, but you haven't gone there yet. And if it's something totally new that nobody's done before, then whatever you're imagining, you haven't done it either. And you won't actually know what works until you start doing it. So I tell entrepreneurs, you know, you think of as many ideas as you want, but don't lock into any single idea. In fact, pick a direction. So pick an, a direction you want to go. Like you said, you know, short-term rentals. Now, there are a lot of things you can do. If you say the short-term rental market is growing like crazy, you know, this is, this is where the, the growth is going to happen over the next 10 years, then you may have an idea. But that idea, there, it may not actually, when you bring it out to market, actually materialize. There may, may be very little demand for that. It may be great in your head, but in reality, it's, it's not much. So what you need to go out and you need to be flexible. You need to say, we're going to go out and startups, doing a startup is an experiment. You're running lots of experiments as fast as you can, gathering as much data and honing in on where, who your customers are and what they really need. That is the key. And then you have to execute on that. And that is where the team comes in. You have to have a, you have to spend a huge amount of time building just the right team because the team and the direction you're headed are the most important things. You go on this journey and through the journey, you keep pivoting, you keep changing, you keep adjusting, course correcting based on what you're learning until you hit it. Gosh, I know I'm going to have a full notepad. See, in a lab, we're always taking notes as you're speaking, and this is just great already. Okay, so I love what you said, and you compared it to experiments very well. I've been dying to ask you this before we got on a call. I'm very excited to ask you this because um, we're in this, you know, I think you've already debunked the idea. Okay, great. You know, it's my idea, right? There's a million ideas. The execution is one thing, but you talked about, and I heard you say this, you didn't say it that way, but I heard proof of concept. So tell us what, what are your thoughts with executing a proof of concept rather than going against the grain or maybe you know back in the day we had horses now we have cars now there's an electric car and all this rock it's like i know you're in the startup space you're in your startup space of kind of innovation but what is your thought of do you think every innovation maybe i should reframe it like this do you think every innovation starts with a foundational proof of concept or do you think that actually an innovation there is no proof of concept and you're really diving in head first you need both. So in order to be an entrepreneur, you have to be a little crazy. You have to just dive in, not knowing everything because you can't know everything. And actually the people who know everything, the industry experts, they're usually stuck. They're actually trapped in a box by their own knowledge because they know too much. So they start closing doors. No, that would never work. No, that would never work. Somebody tried that five years ago or 10 years ago. It didn't work, right? But technology is advancing all the time. New technologies are being born literally every day. And every time one of these new technologies enters the market, an entrepreneur can take that and do something that's never been done, something that didn't work before, something that people haven't tried and don't realize will actually totally change the game. So your job is being a little naive is a good thing. Like that's, that's why a lot of these entrepreneurs who come from outside the industry end up totally disrupting it. They weren't insiders. They, mm. they actually came from the outside because they don't have those preconceptions. They don't have those prejudices that you get when you've been in the industry a long time. So even if you're in the industry, you can train yourself to do this, to say, okay, I'm going to challenge every belief I have. Like I believe all these things to be true, but look, there are all these new technologies, AI, blockchain, you know, you name it, new software platforms coming out literally every month. How can I take one of these and actually start to tweak it to change the market, to change my position in the market, to become more profitable, to give more to my customers? Those are the questions you need to be asking. So it's a continual asking question. Now for venture capital, most venture capital is very conservative. They're not yeah. that adventurous. Like yeah. they want to come in once you have proof of concept. So yeah. you start out without proof of concept. You start out blind, right? And you're just going in there. But in order for you to actually raise a significant amount of money, you need to show them something. I mean, if they're smart money, they're not coming in too early. They're holding back because they yeah. know that, you know, 90% of these startups fail. 
that's why I call you know my latest book surviving a startup because Absolutely. most startups the majority of startups you know from idea all the way through to exit they never make it if you're going to make it you have to be a, one of these people who's relentless like you never give up who's super curious always asking questions and questioning yourself and your own beliefs every step along the way and then you have to be a great leader like you have to be able to take this team of people who could have incredible jobs maybe at microsoft you know maybe at google wherever you know incredible jobs and pull them away into your orbit even though all you have is kind of a vision of where you're headed that's great so so steve uh, yeah, thank you for that by the way it, when you you mentioned a key thing that vcs uh, are, are a little bit more conservative in that sense. I know that you have startup programs at Founders Space. Uh, can you explain if they are just like VCs or maybe they're a little different? They're maybe on, on the closer end of more risky and taking risk. I, I'm just trying to make sure I understand what you can provide uh, to our audience listing. Is, is, that, is that the same thing as VC money and VC backing or is that a little bit different, the programs that you offer? So we offer a huge variety of programs. We offer programs for people with no experience whatsoever. Like they're kind of introductory programs to get them going. And then we uh, offer much more in-depth, sophisticated programs to entrepreneurs who are further along. And let me say, the programs that are open to everybody, uh, those are kind of base level programs. But the ones that are really valuable to us in terms of you know us investing in, the ones where we would put our money in, we we are just like VCs at that point. We are very, very selective because we get thousands of startups applying and we pick a very small percentage of these, a small number mm -hmm. to actually bring into our programs and invest in with our time and our money and all our connections. We want those to be winners. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I work, with, I'm a VC. So I invest in startups. I run the incubator program. I work with, you know, literally hundreds of VCs in Silicon Valley and even more globally. And we have very strict criteria for what we need uh, to actually green light an investment. So startups, if you look at startups, most of them, you know, they're kind of in this gray zone. They haven't, they haven't, they don't have traction. They don't have, a, they're early on. So they don't have a lot of customers. They don't have a lot of user growth or any, you know, any sort of metrics that we can really hang our hat on and say, this is real, you know, this, this is work. It's all relative. Sorry to interrupt you. So, Steve, if you don't mind giving some context of what's a lot in law, are we talking hundreds, thousands, millions? Like what is a lot? It depends on your business model. So if you are a B2B or an enterprise business model, a lot could be, you know, 10 big companies you know, coming to you and signing up with you. You know, if you get mm. 10 Fortune 500 companies, that's a lot, you know. But if you have 10 users on your social app, that's not a lot yeah. <laughs> that, is, uh, that yeah. you need like hundreds of thousands in rapid growth. So what we're doing is we're taking two bets. If they're early on, we're taking a bet on the team and the technology and their vision. If they're later, which is a much better bet, we're actually looking at the numbers. Like, did they break through? Is revenue growing? Are they signing up customers? How, you know, wh where can we extrapolate from the data they have now to where they'll be a year from now, five mm -hmm. years from now? That then it gets real. That's when we, that's when VCs, you know, VCs are not really innovators. What they are is they are great at accelerating the growth of a startup. So they look at a startup that's already figured it all out, you know, has the business model, has the customers. And then they look at this and they say, oh, it costs X amount to acquire a, a new customer. And uh, from this customer, their profit is going to be Y. Wow, if we advance them the money in advance, then we're going to get paid back extra, right? For yeah. every customer over the long term, because the profit, when I say why, it means over the lifetime of the customer. And that lifetime could be three to five years, even longer. Mm -hmm. So they're just saying, oh, we're going to advance you this, these millions of dollars to acquire as many customers as possible early on and dominate that market. Uh, that, that's a great I, I, the thing that gives a good context uh, and, and I'm glad you put it that way uh, one thing that hit, you had mentioned before I want to ask you this other question is you had mentioned um, getting different insights from other industries now um, is that on the when you were talking about that were you saying that 
that for the uh, innovator, this, the, the, the individual leading the startup? Or do you also, and, and again, this is kind of like a, a two-part question, do you see that, you know, maybe yourself, like Founder Space or some other VCs out there, do invest because they know that, hey, this actually model, you could tweak it in a bit, almost kind of like what you see for Shark Tank and say, hey, I have experience investing in X companies and we've had success. If you apply it in this, in this marketplace, you could see the same success. How much of it is it kind of consulting or how much is it more relying on the actual um, um, entrepreneur to make that call or is it more of a partnership thing when you do go with a VC? Like, can you, can you give us that just for some of us who haven't really worked with VCs to understand the relationship? I can, I can explain that. And I talk a lot about kind of innovation aspects mm -hmm. in my other book, Make Elephants Fly, which is mm -hmm. all about how startups innovate. So like you said, most people in this world, I mean, everybody, we don't really come up with new ideas. What we tend to do are borrow ideas that we see working in one space that somebody has stumbled upon and apply them in another space. And we go, wow, this really works here. The Uber model works in, you know, home rentals, right? You know, yeah, whatever yeah. it does, oh, the, the, you know, we can look and everybody is doing this. Everybody is playing around. We're, we're borrowing from everywhere we can. And then we're seeing how it applies in our industry. So as a venture capitalist, I have a lot of experience as a person who actually runs Founders Space, a, a global accelerator. I have even more experience because I work with so many startups. So I see my role when I engage with startups is really showing them what other people are doing. Say, look, people out there are trying this. You should consider this. Or look, I've had five startups go down this path recently and it, they all hit a dead end. Like mm -hmm. I could almost guarantee you because you're doing exactly what they did that you're going to hit a dead end. You're not going to go here. Or there's a blind spot. Like you aren't really going deep on this. You need to go deeper. You need to ask your customer these questions. I don't see that your customer really needs your product. Like you want to believe they do. So you're not asking the tough questions. Well, I need you to go out and, and engage with your customers at a, at a much more granular level to get the data we need to know we're on the right course. Those type of things I do. Uh, and really VCs that we call add value. They're not just about giving you the money they add value, they do that. And I will tell you, when you're an entrepreneur and you want to raise capital, the best way to get an investor on board is not to give them the sales pitch, you know, show them all the mm. shiny stuff that you're doing. You know, the best way is to get their advice, get them thinking about your business, get them excited, get them contributing their ideas. Because we're people like venture capitalists are people and we want to actually build something too. We want to be part of it. It's not just about writing a check and walking away. So remember that when you're raising capital. Uh, man, Steve, I think that's so applicable to anything. I think when you're talking about partnering with someone or you, 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 you want to kind of be a critical thinker of, Hey, uh, Steve, I got this idea. Look, I, I, I got this, you know, either, you know, this, this business opportunity I'm looking at are like these short-term rentals I'm looking to tackle on and, and, and here's what they're cash flowing. Here's the top line. Do you think we could maybe reduce expenses by doing things one way, et cetera? Well, now it, it's showing me that you're in the weeds, you're in the trenches, you're in, in your practitioner, you're thinking. And now we've started a discussion naturally where, you know what, Ruben, I actually think I could step in because I have a property tech company that, you know, automates the, the lock process. And if you put those on there, you would cut your expense in half. Like, you know what I mean? So I think the, the what you just said is it's beyond. I think it's it's just sometimes what we lack of is communication, uh, uh, genuine communication and being open and transparent um, in, in kind of our processes. That way the right people can actually come and help us. I, I, would you agree with that, Steve? I mean, I totally agree. I have one of the rules I give yeah. in, in my books. When engaging with investors, mm -hmm. really when engaging with strategic partners, customers, and your employees, all of them, don't talk, listen, carve out time to stop selling them and start listening and learning from them because these people are really smart. Like a lot of entrepreneurs go, I've pitched 50 investors and I haven't gotten raised any money and I've wasted all this time. I tell them, you wouldn't have wasted your time if you actually listened to them yeah. because those are 50 people who, you know, they may charge a thousand dollars an hour for consulting. These are really high-end people who've run big successful companies. They and have seen hundreds of startups. You have their time. 
use it. Like, you know, give them your idea, show them what you're doing and then engage them. Yeah. That's another thing too, right? I think people sometimes get, can, you know, well, not, not so much in your space, but I think sometimes we have this idea, oh, I have this idea, I must protect it. Well, no, it's the execution, right? That, that That's really the differentiator. I want to shift into uh, one thing you talked about. I You talk about people um, and ideas and it kind of resonated with me. I just came from a, a conference and I was, a, it's just, I was kind of blown away because it was, it's, and, and not necessarily in the, I don't, not to be like on a dark side, but it was like, uh, like I was in a podcast movement conference and it was like, there was tons of booths, right. And people are selling software. And I'm like, I asked this gentleman, I'm like, what's your USP? Like, really? I'm serious. Like we just had Mark Cuban on the stage, talk about fireside and yours sound similar, but um, you know, what is the USP here? And I didn't feel like there was any, and, and, and I, you know, I was just thinking, I'm like, man, my, my goodness, like you talk about a proof of concept is one thing, but then you also now that if there's many proofs of concepts, what's your thought of the importance of an actual unique selling point? Um, or would you rather look at the team? Cause you did mention people and ideas. So for you, what comes first? Is it the USP, the unique selling point, or that's different than, or because you've said that we're not really doing new things, do you look more at the team? Who do you look at first? Look at both. Both <laughs> are critical. No, okay. I'll you can't, to succeed, first of all, you need a great team. You, yeah. The team can have the best idea in the world, the most unique idea mm -hmm. in the world, but if they aren't good at executing, they will drop the ball. And mm -hmm. invariably, somebody else will pick it up and run with it and end up right. scoring. Because, okay. you, you know, they it, executing is really hard. So we do look at the team very closely at the beginning. The second thing is I have a rule. There are only two ways, only two ways to break through as a startup. And if you don't do one of these two things, you are dead in the water. So the first way is when you uh, come into a market, there are always competitors. People are always doing whatever they need to do some way, like whether it's pen and paper or whatever, they are doing it some way. They are getting it done. So you need to have a solution for those people that isn't incrementally better. Like it, it, we're, we're like this other product on the market, but we have these extra features. Features make a product, you know, a little better. What you need to be is exponentially better, an order of magnitude better. So that they will switch because everybody has inertia. We're all using, let's say, Gmail. Are we going to switch to another email provider because they have a few more features? Mm -hmm. No way. Like We figured out Gmail. We're not going to switch. It's true of everything, right? We're just not going to switch for a few more features. It has to be exponentially better. It has to do what we do with email so much better that we're like, okay, I'm giving up Google and I'm moving to this other platform. That is one way. If you can't be exponentially better, then you have to be different. That's your unique selling point. Like, do you, can you offer customers something that they aren't getting from all these other competitors in the marketplace? And is that something really valuable to them? Valuable enough to them so that they will start using your product in addition to the other products. Like mm. they can add it to their portfolio. Again, it's a high bar. Like nobody wants another platform. Nobody needs another piece of software, whether it's an app or a desktop application. We all have enough. We think we have enough. So uh, what is your unique selling point? How valuable it is? If you're just doing what all the other guys are doing, you know, the, the, the team with the most resources and, and, the, and the most connections and the most momentum, it's going to win. It's going to dominate the market. So who's, we see this. It's a winner-take-all market. You know, a company goes out there. All these people are competing. One, one company really figures it out, what their customers need. Then they get a huge amount of capital and they explode. And everybody else is, you know, made nobody. Oh, everybody, you know, how we find out a product. Oh, how we find out about a product. Oh, Joe is using that product. Oh, I heard about that product on the internet. Yeah. Oh, I saw effort, you know, whatever it is that just gains more and more momentum. They get name value. They get brand very hard to displace them. So it's a race to become that one market leader. That is the name of the game. Wow. That's uh that's really interesting. I, it's, it's interesting because it is such a, such a battle. It really is like, and um, I guess, 
you, you talk about team execution and then you, it sounds like you guys are literally pouring gasoline on the fire. Cause you talked about Joe, you know, so-and-so recommending, are you, are you, is that strictly marketing power? Is that what you're saying? Just creating omnipresence at that point that, that really uh, puts, you know, breaks the, 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 the straw that breaks the camel's back. Is that, or is it just purely um, experience uh, giving a user experience or word of mouth. I, I, I don't know. I guess it's a, w- which one would you rely on? If is, Do you think that it's a, really about creating that omnipresence and drowning out the marketplace and kind of just pushing them, hey, this is a new solution that works and this is a proof of concept. We have a good team to execute it. How much do you think marketing can actually kind of tip, tip over the scale? Once you figured it out, once you understand, I can offer my customer this value that they aren't getting anywhere else. It's either exponentially better or it's different, right? Mm -hmm. I can offer them that they really want it. There's a demand for it, right? At this point, you can offer it. Maybe some competitors can offer it. Who is going to win this race? Mm -hmm. Then it comes into who can acquire the most customers, the fastest, build the strongest brand, gain momentum. Once you gain momentum as a market leader, you get more capital and then you can grow even faster. And soon you just leave the competitors behind. All of us, when we make, a, I like to say this, when you have to be the very best, you can't say in the, in the world of technology, I'm going to be second best or third best, uh-huh. because we know that the leader in any market, whether it's Google, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Microsoft, what, the leader in every market is worth exponentially more than all the other players combined. Uh-huh. They don't even come close to the leader. So what you have to do as an entrepreneur out there, is you have to position yourself to become this leader. How do you do that, right? You get the great team, you get the unique value proposition to your customers, you tap into the demand, and then you have to fuel it. You have to add the rocket fuel. And the rocket fuel is venture capital, because that basically gives you the ability to rocket ahead of everybody else. And in the world, uh, when we make a buying decision, we don't buy the second best product. We don't buy the third best product. We, all of us, like if we gave them a choice, we're going to buy what we think is the best. Like this yeah. is the best. And how do we make that decision? You know, we don't go through a ton of data. We, we sort through our mind, whatever comes to mind first, right? Oh, I'm going to search. Google comes to mind first, right? Oh, I'll use Google. Everybody's using Google. It must be the best. You know, I don't know the algorithm of Google versus all other search engines like DuckDuckGo and other ones, you know. I don't know their algorithms, but I know that everybody's using Google, so it must be the best. Like, so gaining that mind share, getting the brand out there, acquiring customers and pushing, that is where, that is how you dominate a market. And then I want to add one other thing. There's something we call the network effect. And the network effect gives you the ability to basically put up a wall, a moat around your business so nobody can get in. And the network effect is basically saying, the more customers I bring in here, the more partners I bring in here, the more value we create together. That's like a social network, like Facebook. Without your friends, it isn't worth much. So new social networks aren't really worth much because they don't have this network effect. Amazon, a marketplace, the more buyers and sellers I bring together, the more value we create for each of them. The sellers want buyers. The buyers want lots of sellers so they can get the lowest price. Mm-hmm. This dynamic, this network effect is really, really powerful. Once you get that, boom, almost nobody can compete with you. You lock them out of the market. Yeah, it's almost like having this, this uh, you literally call it the moat, right? It's like this compounding effect that how happens as the byproduct of your existing systems. Jeez. So as a venture capitalist, I'm always looking for this. Like if a company, not all companies can create a network effect. Like they, not all of them can. They can still be good investments, but the ones that can, these companies dominate. Like they are, they, you, you cannot displace them once they gain, once they become the market leader, it's almost impossible to remove them. So let's talk about that. I think that's a good segue for kind of uh, what well, we going into this, just to relate it to our listeners as well. We, we talk about technology having this huge play. And the first thing that came to mind when you were talking about the, the network effect is I'm thinking like, okay, like an Airbnb, right? Like this, there's literally 
inventory and the more people want to stay places, the more others will also open up their homes to be used. And it's kind of like this. I mean, there's no, there's, they don't even control, they can, Airbnb, I mean, owners own their own assets and they're leveraging a platform. Um, so that's just fascinating. Right? That, Airbnb that? is a perfect example of the yeah. network effect. So mm. I'm using Airbnb now as I travel around the world, yeah, right? It's absolutely. I want more space than a hotel room will give me, you know, at a good price. So Airbnb is incredible. But I look at the other platforms out there and I'm like, I only have so much time to look for the next place I'm going to stay. I'm not going to search on three platforms. No, I'll just go to Airbnb because they have the most inventory. So they're winning in that way. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so Steve, do you see, let's talk about it because Airbnb, you know, as an Airbnb investor myself, uh, there's some really interesting um, technology and, and it's kind of brings it full circle. Cause one of the things I want to make sure that didn't slip through the cracks is building something in addition to what people are already using, which I think is fascinating. So uh, it sounds like if there's Airbnb out there, they're number one. How can you help supply the number one? So there's things like uh, 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 um, beyond pricing, you know, things like in, uh, things that get integrated with the actual dominant platform itself. That if you use as a host, that it can kind of give you the similar experience that in the airline industry gives you when the supply goes up, uh, and or in, and the supply goes up and the prices uh, drop or vice versa, right? What do you know? What can you tell us? Because you're in, you're embedded in so much technology. That's your background. Is there, you know, let's talk property tech, prop tech, right? Is there anything that we, our eyes should perk or you should be on the lookout for or maybe even leverage, utilize, or even maybe build on top of, like you said, uh, when, you, when it comes to the technology within the real estate space, especially uh, property tech, and maybe uh, if you're familiar with the short-term rentals? Yes. In, in any platform, whether it's Amazon, you know, there are lots of innovation going on around Amazon. Lots of people making lots of money on that platform by innovating and in how they sell and all these different things. Yeah. In Airbnb, it's a platform again. It's a whole ecosystem. People can make lots of money offering services on Airbnb, cleaning services, you know, you know, remote entry services, services so that hosts can maximize the, you know, know what to charge as the price, you know, what optimize their pricing, all of these and managing this place, managing a lot of rental properties, platforms for that. So there's a lot of innovation going on, even within the Airbnb ecosystem that isn't owned by Airbnb. And that's true of all of these ecosystems that are built. Now, the prop tech industry is, is huge. Like venture capitalists have, are literally, they have a, in 2019, they invested over 30 billion in the prop tech industry. And now we're 2021. I don't have the numbers for 2021, but I'll tell you it's significantly higher than 30 billion. Like money is pouring into this. And why is it pouring in? I will tell you, number one reason, data. Data will transform the real estate industry. Data is gold. Think about it. Whatever you do in the real estate industry, whether it's setting the price of your rental properties, whether it's reaching out and finding the right customers to rent, whether it's buying and selling property, the more data you have, the more power you have, right? You can, the, if, if you get a lot of data, you can know when a property for sure is undervalued. Wow, that's a good investment. I should buy it right now. If you have enough data, you can know what your cash flow will be with that property. You know how much you how much you can afford to take out as a loan, how much you will make, and you can start predicting all these things in the future. Da the more data we gather, and we are gathering data from a lot of sources, right? There's a lot of public sources out there that you you can gather data from. There's AI right now that can analyze and process this data in amazing ways that our human brains could never do in the past. So we can take these new AI tools and start using them. And there is data being used on managing properties. So there's a huge uh, uh, push right now for putting IoT, internet connected devices mm. into properties on all levels, right? From, ent you know, keyless entry is very simple, security, surveillance, like right now, you, they have AI that can literally look through a camera, a CTV camera, and actually determine whether a person walking by the property is somebody who is scouting it out to break in, or they're just a pedestrian walking by. 
like by their behavior, by how they move, by how they, you know, look at the property, all these subtle signs, they have enough data now to actually say, alert the owner, oh, there's somebody who's looking to break into your property. We know it by looking through this camera. And a human person, you couldn't hire enough people to do that. And people aren't that good at that. They, they, you know, they don't have the experience of watching thousands of people break into properties using security cameras. A data can literally take all this data from all these CCTV the cameras around the world, analyze it and figure out, oh, this is what people do when they're going to break into a property. Wow. This is how they approach the property. This is how they walk. This is how their eyes move. All these different things. Wow. Those contain data. You, um, another huge area, and this is why PropTip is so exciting, you know, is digital engagement, right? Digital engagement with customers, digital engagement with vendors, digital engagement with maintenance people. Like we can be so much more efficient if we start to automate these processes and use uh, digital, like people are engaging with us, they aren't like, it's not person to person. The property business used to be person to person, yeah. people talking to people. You don't have to do that anymore. You can create a whole automated platform where your maintenance people update stuff, they upload it. You, can, you get a dashboard, you're seeing exactly what they're changing, what they're doing. You have devices in the place that are alerting the, the maintenance people, oh, a pipe is broken this, you know, because they're monitoring, you know, there's a water leak here. All of these things, we need to put more insulation there. This whole process of managing properties is being automated. We're working with some amazing startups in this space. One of them is Fuka. Um, they are both in San Diego and in China, and they have built an entire AI platform for rental property management, like based on AI. Another area really exciting is the virtual area. So all of us, because of the pandemic, have moved like right now on Zoom, doing a lot of yep. things remotely. So managing property, a lot of this we used to do in person. Again, we're doing through virtual communications, whether it's video and in the future, virtual reality. Like we are working with startups in Korea and Silicon Valley that are actually pushing the limits of virtual reality. So like, can you get people to buy never having actually physically been in the space and inspected the space? Can they make a buying decision? Well, the answer is yes, you can, right? Yeah. You can. People are buying properties around the world simply by getting enough data about the property and then maybe getting a virtual tour. With that's a what virtual... we did. Yeah, that's what you did. You could talk <laughs> about that. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we, we strictly rely on, I've relied on technology for a long time because I do everything out of state. And um, yeah, and and uh, do business out of state. I mean, you just remotely, right? I, uh, so that's interesting. I think that kind of gives it, plants some seeds as far as to. It goes back to what you said when you started this, and I love that you're bringing it full circle. It goes back to what the marketplace is doing. You know, we've all learned that we're we've gone remote, right? So then, how is this experience for your user? Does your user want to go on site, or do they want to have the ability to see things, you know, remotely? Uh, we, you know, using like the Ring and the, you know, the the uh, what's the other system called? Uh, there, there's a lot that we use from a technology perspective to, to see the videos and stuff like that. We, we want that access because we we're 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 going into now a remote world. Um, so it's it's really fascinating to sh see the shift with prop tech because I know there's a lot of things where you know the short term rental industry is a little bit more of kind of a advanced and reliable in technology with the, some of the models and you're seeing that kind of shift over to some of the traditional uh, models of kind of like commercial real estate multifamily so um, that's so interesting how so if I'm listening to this and I'm a business owner um, you know what what is it's you're so resourceful <clears throat> and for you where do you go is there is there a place that you go to just stay on top of things? how would you how would you encourage someone to stay on top of the innovation i mean you li live and breathe this stuff uh but is there any pointers you can give us and again of course i will definitely uh, tell the audience to you definitely want to make sure you you tune into the surviving uh, a startup you tune in See, I'm talking virtually. Now I'm talking about tuning into reading books. Listen, listen to that. That tells you that I've been doing too much audibles. But having a read at the, the surviving a startup, number one. But as far as just kind of having tools in your tool belt um, and kind of being prepped, is there a source that you go to to stay on top of these trends that you would that would be insightful for our audience or, or, or a place that you go or masterminds or whatever the case might be? Multiple sources. So 
I tell people don't have one source. Well, first of all, mm. a great source are people you can connect with, like experts in different areas. So experts mm. in technology, experts in prop tech. Can you bring them on your board of advisors? Can you incentivize them to keep you up to date on these things? Because if you're managing a lot of property and you have a lot of business, you don't e necessarily even have the time to keep up on everything. Second ways, podcasts like this, like, you know, incredible resources. You know, we also have a podcast at Founderspace. You go to Founderspace, you can check it out. We're, you know, updating people on technology. Blogs, there are tons of blogs out there, you know, about everything like TechCrunch and GigaOM and all these different slash dot, all these different blogs about technology, some very specific to property that you can, you know, subscribe to and basically get an update very quickly. So all of these are viable. The most important thing is that you do keep up in date to date. You don't assume that because things were this way in the past, they're going to be this way in the future. Also, you want a competitive edge. If you're out there, you want to be able to make a lot of money. If you want to be able to make a lot of money, you got to understand how the industry is changing and where the opportunities are in the future. Because other people are going to be arming themselves with these latest tools, with advanced AI to scout the market, you know, to figure out the best deals. If, if they have these tools and you don't, they're going to get the best deals and you aren't. It's that simple. So you need to know that they exist. And then you need to carve out time to adopt them, to try them out. Like, first of all, you want to vet them, make sure that really knowledgeable people understand that, oh, wow, this AI platform is really, really amazing. It's not a waste of your time. Once you understand that, either you do it or you get somebody on your team who's dedicated to doing that, dedicated to going out to the new platform, figuring out if they're, they really work for you. And then it takes time integrating them into your process. Yeah, it goes. I, I love that because it's it's also it's not just for yourself. It's how do you bring it back home to the team, uh, making sure the team is 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 kind of in sync and in, or in sync. I should say ahead of the curve, uh, because it is. You, you've reminded us today, Steve, that it's a very competitive marketplace, and um, he who is the most equipped, or she, of course, uh, wins the game. And you know, it, it's it's especially in this day and age where. What a time to be alive to leverage uh, the technology that's around us. And I really appreciate you <clears throat> coming into the lab and kind of giving us your ingredients of your successful experiments that you've had with partners in your multiple <laughs> areas of success that you've had with your companies, whether it's win or wins or losses. There's a lot that you gave us there mm -hmm. that we can take away from this. Now, <clears throat> I got to say, I, d I definitely have to say that. You know, you have a new book coming out. It's called The Five Forces. Uh, and, and again, you've done such a good job of keeping up with the times. What can we expect coming into The Five Forces? I know we talked about this offline that, you know, surviving a startup is more of like that kind of the core for the entrepreneur. What's The Five Forces, if you can give us like a foreshadow going to be about so who someone's listening might, you know, add that to their list and, and definitely consider it added to their, their cart for sure. So The Five Forces is about how key technologies are going to transform our lives and every business on the planet. So it goes into depth on what are the five key technological drivers that are coming right now that will totally, like the internet did in the past, like mobile did in the past, Disrupt. what are the ones coming now that are going to reshape everything about property, right? But everything, but beyond that, everything about how we live our lives, everything about how we do business. So that's what the book is about. And I, I wrote it in the way that I talk. So all my books are written in a very easy to understand way. Even though they deal with technology and complex concepts, I boil them down into a way where you can go, I get it, right? I get it. And you have actionable items to take away. Oh, wow, this changes how I view the world. Now I'm, now I'm getting a sense for what I need to do in my life and my business and how these things are going to impact them. Steven, you, I got to ask you this before you drop and, and, you know, you're, you're, you say you've been saying a lot in the Airbnbs, I'm an investor myself. If there is a, an area uh, where you feel that in the next five years, what do you think that experience will look like checking in maybe five to 10 years? Where, where do you think the impact might be checking in, staying, checking out? Uh, is it hosts the platform? Like, I'm just thinking like, where do you think it could go based on what you know? Cause I, I, you have a deep level route. So maybe you have an idea of how yeah. things might look. 
Thoughts? I'm a customer of Airbnb, right? I yeah. rent places all over the world. So yeah. I'm a, a heavy duty user. And I will tell you what I need. Like I spend a lot of time looking at the ratings, too much time. It is very time consuming looking. And then you have to look at the ratings, but the star ratings aren't enough because I like a clean place. And I've had places that have been pretty highly rated, like 4.8 stars, but they're not clean, at least not up to what I would consider clean standards. You know, mm. maybe they got that rating because they, they lowered the price. Maybe some of them that didn't have enough reviews got the rating because they somehow invited their friends on and got them to review, yeah. you know, give them. I had places that said they were immaculate and they were a pigsty. Right. And they like had 10 reviews and they were five stars. Couldn't, you know, so apparently they got a lot of people to lie. So what I'm looking for more than anything is an AI I can use that will go out there and analyze these reviews and tell me, well, you're going to be happy with this place. Another thing is I, you know, when I look at the pictures, you can't tell like a lot of the pictures of the places, they look nice, but you go there and they aren't that nice. And other places don't look nice because the photography wasn't great or whatever, and they are you're passing up a really great place. So can I get an experience, a, a deeper experience, a deeper sense for what these places are like? Like, are they really nice? Can I get a virtual tour, right? They don't have that on Airbnb. Uh -huh. Can I get more video? They don't really, people aren't uploading yeah. videos. You know, I just get these static pictures, very hard to determine whether the place is great. Also, um, you know, the uh, so... Going Airbnb has done a lot of things right. So right now it's you know easy to communicate with hosts. It's easy to book a place. It's easy, you know, they have lots of inventory. All of these things are working great. I'm talking about the next level. Like we're, you know, I want a painless, seamless thing. I want to say, I am going, you know, to Milwaukee. Find me the 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 place I would like that you know I would like, you know, that's, you know, and I have my preferences already set. So now every time I do an Airbnb search, I have to reset my preferences. Like I'm oh, literally okay. resetting yeah. the preferences every time, you know, oh, I need Wi Fi. Oh, I need a kitchen. Oh, I need, oh, I need a washer and dryer. Oh, and, you know, all these different things. That's a waste yeah. a lot of my time. Like, um, you know, that's a simple one. Could they just save the preferences for me, please? Yes. But, but even more important, why should I have to search? Why shouldn't I be able to talk into Siri or Google or Alexa and literally say, I'm, you know, I'm traveling to New York, get me a place, get me the best price place that meets all my criteria and come back to me with it and then book it for me. Like I just want to show up. So these things are really, uh, you know, the next level for me as a customer, what I want. For hosts, again, there's, I'm sure you have a lot of management. And I know my friends, like one of my friends, he has 15 Airbnb houses that he rents out near Disneyland. Like, and it is a great business, but it consumes his life. Like mm -hmm. he can literally not, you know, when I, even when I'm hanging out with him, he's picking up the phone every minute, worried that, you know, somebody, there's a problem and that he has to go fix it. And he's kind of a slave to the ratings. He doesn't want to get a lower rating. So he has yes. to respond even when he's on vacation. There has to be solutions out there for hosts that make their life easier. Yeah. Wow, I think you gave us a lot of gems and opportunities for us to really optimize our experience. So with that, I can't thank you enough for coming to the lab. Uh, if you want to definitely tap into more of what Steve is doing, Captain Hoff, you want to make sure you go to founderspace.com. And honestly, I'm going to grab a pair definitely of the five forces and I'm going to tap into the uh, surviving a startup because uh, we're in this space to not only survive, but also thrive. So uh Captain Hoff, thank you so much. Uh, where else, is there any other call to action you'd like to kind of give our listeners or, or kind of leave us with a, with one one more last thing as, as you kind of uh, sail away into your journey here, uh, kind of impacting others and accelerating their growth? Yes. Anybody who wants to reach out to me for any reason, you know, we, we have our own incubator and accelerator spaces. We're always looking for partners, people who have entrepreneurs who want to submit their business plans can come to Founder Space and do that. People want to connect with me on LinkedIn or Facebook or social networks. Just look for Founder Space or my name and you will find me. And if you want to come to Founder Space, we also have a free offering. So we have the 10 commandments of raising venture capital. You can get it for free. It's a, a video series. It doesn't take long. It takes like 45 minutes, but really gives you the lowdown if you're raising venture capital and go to Founder Space slash T-E-N, 10. 
I love it. If you're driving, keep your hands on a wheel. We'll include that in the show notes. And again, Steve, can't thank you enough, Captain Hoff. Just thank like you. that, we are signing out. Hold up. We've come to the end of the Real Estate Experiment show brought to you by my team at investedtalent.com. However, the show will certainly not stop from here because you will share this with someone who was not in the lab with us. Any value that you found was helpful, any experiment that you feel can benefit someone else who was not here, please share it with them. And number two, definitely leave us a review. It helps us and it helps other people find our show to benefit from experimenters like yourself, right? We are trying to build an experiment nation where the experiments that you resonate the most with, you will double down on. That is the goal. Now, the reason why the show does not end here is because my team at Invested Talent repurposes this show so that other people who are not consuming the show either by the medium that you're consuming in it now, whether it's a podcast, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Instagram, wherever you are, we will take clips from this show and repurpose them and amplify them, put them on multiple social media platforms so that the message and the experiments can be consumed in a way that fits the person best. Now, if you'd like to have the same for your brand, make sure you go to investedtalent.com where we've helped multiple, multiple thought leaders in the real estate space repurpose their content so that they can grow their brand. We specifically work with people who are looking to have an impact, whether you have an existing show or a brand new show, whether it's a podcast, whether it's clips or interviews or episodes, we will take that raw content and repurpose it on multiple social media platforms because your voice, your experiments need to be heard in the marketplace so that we can all have an impact, so we can impact others and we can all elevate together. On that note, make sure you tune into the next one and let's build y'all.